Hello everyone and welcome to IVSA Bather's official YouTube channel Pashuwani. Pashuwani is a platform that provides you with veterinary education. Our video series consists of practical relevant lecture videos, field approach clinical aspects, guide and tip for future careers, smart content related to both animal and veterinary science. We believe sharing is caring, so please like, comment and subscribe for further updates. And now Let's welcome a speaker of today's episode of Saturday's Sharing. Hello everyone. Today we are going to discuss one of the important endocrine disorder of dogs, canine hypothyroidism. Now the first slide, if you look at it, the title is very apt. Are we over diagnosing canine hypothyroidism? This is actually, this was a lead paper which I have presented during SAPI conference which was held in the year 2017 in veterinary college Bidar. Okay, So this question always uh, arise in minds of veterinarians who are in pet practice that the whether the dog presented to him is really suffering from hypothyroidism or not. So many a times you know because of the um, the laboratory facilities which are not available, the thyroid thyroxine assay is delayed and many a times the dogs are treated with thyroxine supplementation without confirming the hypothyroidism. So that's why many a times we say that whether we are over diagnosing canine hypothyroidism. Now the first slide, it has been, uh, it depicts regarding the what will be the presentation the contents of the presentation. So it is a canine hypothyroidism is a quite challenging uh, endocrine disorder in case of pet practice uh, because the variation in the clinical presentation. The dog is presented with so much of you know a variety of clinical signs sometimes it creates a confusion in the minds of veterinarian whether hypothyroidism in the dog is there or not. Okay, so the two terminologies which are commonly used are euthyroid and hypothyroid. Euthyroid means the dog is having normal hypothyroid, uh, normal thyroid function, whereas hypothyroid means hypothyroid dog means a dog which is having a deranged or altered thyroid, thyroid gland function. Okay, so you have to differentiate that. This we will discuss in the diagnosis of canine hypothyroidism. Okay. Then this presentation also will give emphasis on the selection of most appropriate test for the uh, diagnosis of canine hypothyroidism which will overcome the confusion in the interpretation of the results and the presentation also discusses about the therapeutic regimen which has to be followed for the treatment of canine hypothyroidism and what are the uh, points to be kept it in mind once the thyroxine assay is started thyroxine supplementation is started in the dog suspected for canine hypothyroidism okay now in the third slide you can see uh, the location of the thyroid gland has been shown over here it is present in the upper one third uh, uh, area of the neck and it is a bilobed vascular structure located lateral to the proximal tracheal rings okay then in case of other species, especially in case of goats uh, and even large animals also, one condition has been pronouncedly identified, they call it as goiter. So this goiter is also nothing but a hypothyroidism, but it is basically because of the uh, iodine deficiency and it is very much pronounced in case of human beings also, wherein uh, because of the, thyro the iodine deficiency, the gland uh, undergoes a type of hyperplasia and it is visible. So even in case of goats also, a palpable enlargement of thyroid gland can be seen. So that's why in this uh, photograph you can see where is the location of the thyroid gland. It remains the same in most of the species, upper one third part of the tracheal rings, okay, on the lateral sides. What are the functions of the thyroid gland? Thyroid thyroid gland is responsible for production of T3 and T4. T4 is tetraiodothyronine 
and T3 stands for triiodothyronine out of which T4 is the most more active hormone and that participates in the form of thyroxine in metabolic activities. But the secretion of T3 and T4 is under the influence of thyrotrophin released from pituitary gland. In other words, it is called as thyroid stimulating hormone TSH which is released from the pituitary under the influence of TRH thyrotropin releasing hormone okay so you have to understand that when there is a um, body experiences the thyroxine deficiency a feedback mechanism is there which gives a stimulus to the pituitary gland pituitary gland under the influence of TRH releases the TSH and this uh, thyroid stimulating hormone has got a direct stimulating effect on the thyroid gland for the production of T3 and T4 okay so basically what you have to understand the hypothyroidism can potentially arise from defect in any of these areas means it could be the affection of the gland thereby reduced production of T3 or T4 or it could be centrally uh, responsible the hypothyroidism where the pituitary gland is not able to produce the requisite quantity of TSH to give a stimulus to the thyroid gland for the production of T3 and T4. So in etiology we are going to discuss these points elaborately. So these slides you can see. So as I already told you the etiology can be, can be categorized or Hykanian hypothyroidism can be categorized into two types. One is primary hypothyroidism where the gland is responsible or there is a problem with the gland because of which the gland is not able to produce the requisite quantity of thyroxine. In this there are three major categories. One which is the most common that is th th lymphocytic thyroiditis. 95% of the thyroid hypothyroidism cases they are of primary in nature and that too because of the lymphocytic thyroiditis the cause is unknown but it is considered that is a autoimmune disorder wherein the gland itself is considered as foreign and immune response is evoked against the gland and because of that there is a cellular infiltration and which cells they predominate lymphocytes so that's why it is called as lymphocytic infiltration of the thyroid gland which ultimately causes a inflammatory change and then atrophy of the gland so lymphocytic thyroiditis so you have to keep it in mind 95 percent of the hypothyroidism cases in dogs they are basically because of the lymphocytic thyroiditis the other type of primary hypothyroidism is idiopathic thyroidal atrophy which accounts for less than 5 percent of the cases wherein there is a degeneration of follicular cells with reduction in the follicular size replacement of normal parenchyma of the thyroid gland with adipose connective tissue so this appears to be a non-inflammatory degenerative process and here also the cause is unknown. Few reports this has suggest that lymphocytic thyroiditis in over a period of time ultimately leads to idiopathic thyroidal atrophy. But anyway, what you have to understand, it is a distinctly different from lymphocytic thyroiditis where there is a uh, atrophy of the th thyroid gland and normal uh, parenchymal tissue of the thyroid gland is replaced with the adipose connective tissue. Then the third very rare type of hypothyroid, primary hypothyroidism is congenital hypothyroidism which is seen in neonatal puppies. It is also referred as fading puppy syndrome where there is a hypoplasia, dysgenesis or urgenesis of the thyroid gland and most of the affected puppies they die over a period of time. Okay? So fading puppy syndrome it is because of the congenital hypothyroidism. Now when we say that 95% of the hypothyroidism cases in dogs they belong to this category that is lymphocytic thyroiditis. You have to understand the epidemiology of this. It is prevalent in medium to large sized breeds of the dogs. Okay, so it is relatively uncommon in smaller breeds of dogs or toy breeds. Okay, the age group which is more susceptible to canine hypothyroidism is 4 to 10 years of age. Occasionally, it has been reported that the animals as young as 2 years can also suffer with lymphocytic thyroiditis and represent a canine hypothyroidism. Uh, among the breeds, Doberman Pinschers, Golden Retrievers, uh, Cocker Spaniels, 
iris setters terrier breeds they are more prone for canine hypothyroidism when compared to the other breeds boxers and great danes to have a more susceptibility when compared to the other breeds of the dogs for canine hypothyroidism then it has been well documented that the risk of canine hypothyroidism is more or high in spayed females secondary hypothyroidism secondary it is also sometimes called as central hypothyroidism because the basic problem is with the reduced tsh secretion from the pituitary gland and in most of the cases it is space occupying lesion sol some tumor mass is there adjoining to the pituitary gland which suppresses or which causes compression of the gland and because of that the pituitary gland is not able to produce the requisite quantity of tsh which is a direct stimulus to the thyroid gland so in absence of requisite tsh the thyroid gland doesn't produce the requisite quantity of thyroxine leading to hypothyroidism sometimes it has been uh, documented that the suppression of pituitary gland and then inadequate tsh secretion can also be as a result of exogenous glucocorticoid therapy so sometimes a dog is present uh, uh, kept on glucocorticoid therapy so under such type of situation there is a suppression of pituitary gland and thereby the requisite quantity of tsh is not released and it ultimately leads to a type of central hypothyroidism which results into a decreased secretion of the thyroxine from the uh, thyroid gland because of the inadequate tsh sometimes spontaneous hyperadrenal corticism also has been related with canine hypothyroidism clinical signs so before clinical signs you have to keep it in mind the thyroxine is considered as a master hormone it has got influence on so many body systems so because of that the clinical variation is too much but the prominent uh, you know the clinical signs can be categorized into three or four types most important one is dermatological presentation okay so this is the most common presentation of canine hypothyroidism wherein you can see hair thinning poor quality of hairs dry and brittle hairs so if you just palpate and you try to see the quality of hairs you will see they are very much dry and they are very fragile suddenly they break into uh, pieces then the rough hair coat rat tail appearance in subsequent slides i will show you a photograph rat tail appearance is nothing but the alopecia is more prominent on the tail so the tail is devoid of any hairs and it it, it resembles with a rat tail so that's why it is called as a rat tail appear tailed appearance hyperpigmentation is also very common which is more pronounced in the axial region then the inguinal region and in and around genitalia at the base of the tail neck ventral abdomen hyperpigmentation or slightly brownish to blackish discoloration it is also called as melanization it is also a one of the clinical presentation of hypothyroidism recurrent pyoderma seborrhea sicca seborrhea um, alloza then uh, otitis then skin thickening these are also um, some of the features of Uh, canine hypothyroidism metabolic uh, presentation of canine hypothyroidism basically uh, thyroxine is directly re related with the basal metabolic rate maintenance of basal metabolic rate so in absence of thyroxine thyroxine the bmr goes down so because of that the animal shows least uh, involvement in the routine activities the dog is lethargic there is a weight gain exercise intolerance mental dullness bradycardia even sometimes there is irregular type of heart beats generalized weakness we are going to see the cardiac involvement in case of canine hypothyroidism in next one or two slides okay so most of times the owner is very particular that the my dog was very active and suddenly it become lethargic it doesn't show any interest in routine activities he used to actually be very anxious when i used to take him out and he was always ready whenever i used to take him for the walk but in recent one or two weeks i am finding that he is very lazy in spite of you know i am i want to take him for the walk he shows reluctance and he doesn't uh, participate in routine activities so dull dog okay is a very distinct feature of canine hypothyroidism neuromuscular uh, clinical signs which includes polyneuropathies 
पेरिफेरल वेस्टिबुलर डिसीज फेशियल नर्व पैलिसिस सेंट्रल नर्वस सिस्टम साइंस लाइक सीजर्स अटैक्स या सर्कलिंग ओके सो दीज आर द इन फ्यू केसेस यू आर यू कैन आर सी सच टाइप ऑफ सिम्टम्स आल्सो सो अनलेस एंड टिल यू इवेल्युएट द डॉग लेबोरेटरी लेबोरेटरी प्रोसीजर्स यू विल नॉट बी एबल टू से दैट द डॉग इज सफरिंग फ्रॉम कैन एन एपोथाइडिजम ओके द अदर साइंस इंक्लूड कॉर्नियल लिपिडोसिस कैरेटो कंजेंटाइटिस सिका रिड्यूस्ड माइकार्डियल फंक्शन रिप्रोडक्टिव एबनॉमिलिटीज then yes i b b o that is that stands for small intestinal bacterial bacterial overload leading to recurrent episodes of diarrhea so these are the some of the features which are very commonly encountered in dogs suffering from canine hypothyroidism okay then uh, in next slide i will tell you few there are distinct uh, you know photographs are there here you can see the how the dog, the first uh, photo how the dog is dull is not at all responsive in sitting in one corner so this is very distinct feature a lethargic type of dog okay that it may be suffering from hypothyroidism in second photograph you can see there is a alopecia typically it is more more pronounced on the trunk region it can be on the lateral side of the body also then on the tail the alopecia is very very prominent which i will show you in the next slide then these two lower two photographs you can see if you look at the dog dog looks very dull and it is as though it is in a very sad mood so they called as tragic expression of the dog okay so sad dog or tragic expression uh, on the face this is basically because of the myxedema myxedema is nothing but the edemat uh, edematous tendencies this is more pronounced on the lower eyelid so because of that the lower eyelid drops okay so because of the dropping of the lower, the lower eyelid the there is a typical sad appearance of the face hmm? nowadays you are using smileys to show uh, happy mood and sad mood so the similar situation so because of the myxedematous changes and edematous tendencies in the lower eyelid so the eyelid drops and it gives a typical tragic expression to the face so this is very very much identifiable in dog okay so you can see the, these two dogs where you can see there is a tragic facial expression then here you can see in the uh, this slide there is a typical rat tail appearance uh, have you seen any rat rat doesn't have any hair on the tail so uh, the in dogs also you can see the alopecia is very much prominent on the tail and the whole tail will be devoid of any hairs so that's why it is called as a rat tailed appearance and again this is one more dog which is showing a tragic tragic facial expression then this is another interesting slide obesity and hypothyroidism many many times you know in the clinical features also i have told you the dog is lethargic and weight gain is very distinct in case of hypothyroidism so this actually slide uh, you know makes a more clarity on that obesity affects approximately 25% of the canine population okay whereas the prevalence of hypothyroidism is estimated as low as 0.0.2 to 0.6% so that's why hypothyroidism is a rare cause of canine obesity so always a obese dog which is presented to you with some you know a uh, little bit of dermatological uh, problem need not to you need not have to jump to conclusion that the dog is suffering from hypothyroidism unless and until it is confirmed through laboratory investigation okay so that's why weight gain is commonly considered as a one of the clinical feature of the dogs affected with hypothyroidism but it is always not true okay this is hardly in 40% of the cases the remaining 60% it may not be true so obesity and hypothyroidism previously we used to say that they go hand in hand but it is not always correct okay then the cardiac involvement i was telling you thyroxin has got a direct positive ionotropic effect on the myocardium and myocardial contraction is directly related with the stroke volume the amount of blood which is thrown into the circulation so isn't it so because of the positive ionotropic effect the myocardial contraction is up to the mark and the stroke volume is normal so but whereas in case of hypothyroidism because of the thyroxin deficiency myocardial weakening is seen and because of that the requisite quantity of stroke volume is not achieved 
so dogs with pre existing heart disease are worsened uh, because of the concurrent hypothyroidism it has been proved beyond doubt okay and then it has been also reported that the cardiac disease linked to the hypothyroidism in dogs is dilated cardiomyopathy dcm wherein there is a enlargement of the heart so enlarged heart weakened by cardium ultimately leads to a congestive heart failure like state so the dilated cardiomyopathy and hypothyroidism they say that they have got a correlation reproductive involvement reproductive abnormalities like anastrum galactorrhea then infertility prolonged inter stress interval in beaches decreased fertility and decreased libido in males all have been attributed to the hypothyroidism in dogs diagnosis diagnosis of canine hypothyroidism mainly depends upon the hormonal assay and some other parameters which are suggestive of canine hypothyroidism so let us uh, concentrate on the supportive parameters so biochemical and hematological abnormalities in biochemistry you will find a typical hyperlipidemia which is represented by elevated levels of cholesterol and triglycerides about 80% of the dogs suffering with canine hypothyroidism will always have elevated levels levels of cholesterol and triglycerides okay in about 30% of the canine hypothyroidism cases there is a increase in two specific liver enzymes one is alkaline phosphatase the other one is gamma glutamyl transferase alp and ggt so elevation of alp and ggt can also be considered as a supportive laboratory parameter for the confirmation of hypothyroidism then fructosamine concentration this has been proved beyond doubt in case of human patient that there is a increased fructosamine concentration and in the, the human being suffering from hypothyroidism but uh, the attention has not been paid in case of dogs maybe in few days to come probably somebody will work on this and there also you can see there there some change in the uh, fructosamine concentration if it is related it, it can be also be considered as one of the supportive parameter for the diagnosis of canine hypothyroidism let us come down to the most important uh, uh, confirmative test for hypothyroidism so there are you know different uh, diagnostic protocol t3 t4 tsh assays are done usually a specific uh, by uh, laboratory procedure known as electrochemiluminescence immunoassay e c l i a is used for the uh, estimation of these hormones t3 t4 and tsh okay the serum t4 value is considered as a mainstay diagnostic test for the confirmation of um, uh, canine hypothyroidism and uh, many times it is also called as first line diagnostic test the t4 level ranges between 2 to 4 microgram per deciliter and in international units it is expressed as 25 to 50 millimoles per liter so depending upon the laboratory uh, they will express the total t4 value either in microgram per deciliter uh, per deciliter or millimole per liter so both the values are there anything less than this is considered as low or decreased level of total t4 okay nowadays uh, free t4 uh, is uh, considered to be a important parameter and uh, few reports they say that it is more diagnostic it has got more diagnostic value in compared to the total t4 anyway in con- the uh, what you can call it as the laboratory test results they are basically means which laboratory test is more accurate it depends upon the sensitivity and specificity of the test so in next few slides we will understand which test is more appropriate and it should be followed for the diagnosis of canine hypothyroidism now one more thing you have which you have to keep it in mind in diagnosis of canine hypothyroidism is categorization because in etiology you have seen that canine hypothyroidism can be of primary type or secondary type though 95% of the canine hypothyroidism cases they are because of the primary origin and lymphocytic thyroiditis but in spite of that uh, as a clinician you have to categorize whether it is a primary hypothyroidism or secondary hypothyroidism for that the tsh response test is done so externally 
the um, thyroid stimulating hormone is injected and a response of thyroid gland is evaluated. How you are going to evaluate? You have to estimate the total T4. A specific uh, quantity of TSH is given externally and then the total T4 is estimated in the patient. So imagine a dog is suffering from primary hypothyroidism. In primary hypothyroidism, the gland is affected. Either there is a lymphocytic thyroiditis or there is a dysgenesis or uh, idiopathic atrophy of the gland. So in such type of situation, the gland loses its ability to produce th the thyroxine hormone, isn't it? So the gland is affected, so the thyroxine production is reduced. So in such type of cases, if you give externally TSH also, there will, there will not be a substantial increase in the total T4 value. So this says that the case belongs to primary hypothyroidism. Whereas, whereas the other situation also you have to keep it in mind, the gland is normal, but the TSH from the pituitary gland is less in secondary hypothyroidism, isn't it? In such type of cases, if you give a specified dose of TSH externally, you will find substantial increase in the total T4 value. Okay? So this says that the gland is normal, but the TSH secretion uh, from the pituitary is the major factor which is not giving stimulus to the gland and thereby uh, the, the thyroxine is not released from the gland. So this is called a secondary hypothyroidism. So TSH response basically gives you a clarity between primary or secondary hypothyroidism. The other uh, laboratory investigation is biopsy, okay, biopsy of thy thyroid gland. So ultrasound guided um, uh, biopsy uh, needle is inserted into the gland, the sample is collected and histological structure of the gland is evaluated. Okay, So you can see in primary hypothyroidism whether it is lymphocytic thyroiditis or thyroidal atrophy because of the idiopathic uh, factors in such type of changes you will find a typical lymphocytic infiltration or dysgenesis or thyroidal atrophy the normal parenchyma will be replaced by adipose connective tissue so such changes if histologically are evident in the biopsied sample you can see that the gland is undergoing a change and because of that it is a primary hypothyroidism whereas secondary in secondary hypothyroidism if the biopsy sample will show that the eco structure of the thyroid gland is normal but in spite of that the t4 is less so in such type of situation you can say that probably it is a secondary hypothyroidism or central hypothyroidism or pituitary dependent hypothyroidism Then next slide you see this is considered to be the most important and gold standard test for the confirmation of uh, uh, canine hypothyroidism. So they say that the canine TSH and total T4 value should be assessed simultaneously, not diff uh, alone. Okay, So the TSH should not be is uh, estimated uh, in isolation because it will not give you a correct picture. So combinedly you have to estimate canine TSH and the total T4 assay. So combined decreased total T4 and increased canine TSH has got about 95% specificity. So any dog which is showing decreased total T4 and increased TSH is a clear cut case of canine hypothyroidism because we have seen that 95% of the canine hypothyroidism cases they belong to a primary hypothyroidism lymphocytic thyroiditis so the gland is a uh, gland is destroyed because of the one of the other reason and the thyroxine is not released in sufficient quantity so in such type of situation the tsh will be normal or slightly more than normal elevated but the total t4 will always be decreased so in 95 percent of such cases canine hypothyroidism is present and this therefore this has become a hallmark of initial laboratory diagnosis of canine hypothyroidism. So here you can see TSH and uh, T4 values. So there are two probabilities TSH is either normal or TSH is increased. The other two possibilities the total T4 is decreased or total T4 is normal. So if TSH is normal the level of TSH is normal and the total T4 is decreased you have to wait 
don't jump to conclusion that the dog may be uh, hypothyroid or suffering from canine hypothyroidism okay you have to wait and a retest should be performed after about 4 weeks or so time okay or you can go for estimation of free t4 if free t4 is also decreased then probably there is a probability of uh, canine hypothyroidism okay so always normal tsh with decreased t4 need not have to conclude that the dog is suffering from canine hypothyroidism okay so the other possibility the tsh is normal as well as t4 is normal in such type of situation clearly you can say that the dog is euthyroid and you need not have to un undertake any more investigation for thyroid dysfunction okay it is a normal dog then the other probability is tsh is increased okay tsh is increased but t4 is decreased it is a 100% case of hypothyroidism okay the tsh is increased but t4 is normal in such type of situation you have to evaluate or you have to find out whether dog is being maintained on any sulfonamide therapy because sulfonamides they are known to suppress the thyroid function so sometimes you can see a uh, t4 uh, antibody interference also has been seen that is called as non thyroidal illness so because of that the t4 may be normal but the TSS is increased. In such type of situation, sulfonamide therapy should be withdrawn and retest should be done to say whether the T4 is normal or not or whether there is an antibody interference or not in this evaluation of T4. Okay. So, the confirmation of uh, canine hypothyroidism is elevated TSH and decreased total T4 it is a 100% confirmation that the dog is suffering from hypothyroidism. Now, the small doubt may uh, elevate in your mind that why the TSS should be more or increased. A very simple concept. Okay. See, we say that 95% of the canine hypothyroidism cases, they are because of primary uh, dysfunction of the gland and in majority of the cases, it is lymphocytic thyroiditis isn't it so the gland is affected the gland is dysfunctional because of that the thyroxine is not produced so there is a lack of thyroxine in the system it gives a negative feedback to the pituitary that thyroxine is not there so the pituitary keeps on pumping or in increased secretion of tsh is there so elevated tsh but low t4 is a hallmark of canine hypothyroidism try to keep it in mind Okay, so that's why this differentiation table will tell you how the total T4 and TSH has to be interpreted. Okay, now free T4. Recently, many uh, you know um, people they talk about free T4. So they say that the free T4 is a metabolic active fraction of total T4 and represents the hormonal fraction that is available for the tissue uptake, and that's why. Uh, people say that instead of going for total T4, you can go for free T4 estimation. But most of the laboratory uh, investigations have revealed that the specificity and sensitivity of free T4 is approximately 90% and 80%. Okay, So, those specificity is 90%, but the sensitivity is at 80%, which is the corresponding, correspondingly, it is lower value than the total T4 estimation okay that's why uh, it is recommended that the free taper t4 estimation or measurement should be taken up as a second line diagnostic test not a first line uh, laboratory test or diagnostic diagnostic test for the confirmation of canine hypothyroidism so which is the most appropriate canine uh, laboratory test for the uh, diagnosis of canine hypothyroidism it is combined estimation of canine tsh and total t4 so elevated or increased tsh with decreased total t4 value is 100% confirmation of canine hypothyroidism now once we have confirmed that the and dog is suffering from canine hypothyroidism then the therapeutic protocol so they say that the synthetic sodium levothyroxine therapy is the most appropriate because it is uh, the bioavailable bioavailability of this product is very high and it has got longer shelf life 
so that's why this is preferred or treat, it is a treatment of choice and it is given at the rate of 20 to 40 microgram per kg body weight in single or divided doses preferably it is given single dose and it is administered without food preferably on the empty stomach keep it in mind so dosing and timing of thyroxine supplementation should be very specific early in the morning and at the rate of either 20 milli 20 to 40 microgram per kg body weight or 0.02 to 0 0.04 milligram per kg body weight so that is the dose of thyroxine so let us presume that uh, the dog is weighing about 25 kgs and suffering from canine hypothyroidism you start with the lowest dose that is 20 microgram per kg body weight 20 microgram into 25 kg it comes to 500 micrograms so variety of preparations are available in the market starting from 50 microgram 100 microgram like that so the most common available uh, commercial preparation is 100 microgram uh, tablets so we have come to conclusion 25 kg dog requires about 500 microgram of uh, thyroxine so five tablets of 100 microgram should be given orally uh, early in the morning empty stomach to a dog suffering from canine hypothyroidism again you have to keep it in mind it is a lifelong obligation because we have understood that the gland is no more able to produce thyroxine and thyroxine is routinely required hormone in the body so it needs to be supplemented externally okay so this is very important the um, uh, dose should be calculated perfectly uh, the body as per the body weight and it should be given early in the morning as a single dose preferably on the empty stomach now why we are talking about uh, you know um, what happens is the laboratory investigation of this uh, TSH and T4 not all district even district headquarters they do not have labs to estimate T3 and T4 or TSH so certain uh, dedicated labs like thyrocare are there where the sample has to be sent and it requires about two to three days time so most of times what happens is the veterinarian he just thinks that the dermatological uh, presentation of a dog is, uh, is uh, likely to be a canine hypothyroidism and then he starts the therapy okay so it may be a euthyroid dog okay if it is a hypothyroid dog well and good the dog may respond but euthyroid dogs also respond very effectively for the external supplementation of thyroxine okay so there is a false impression that the dog is improving by thyroxine supplementation and in such type of cases there is always a chance of thyrotoxicosis even in hypothyroid cases also if the dose adjustment is not there monitoring of thyroxine level is not done there is always a possibility of thyrotoxicosis which we are going to see in the next slide okay so laboratory monitoring post treatment of canine hypothyroidism cases uh, is very very important so what uh, the slide says the dogs receiving once a day treatment have a marked increase in circulating total t4 value and peak value of t4 approximately reaches six hours post treatment so for example at nine o'clock if you have given the requisite quantity at the rate of 20 microgram per kg body weight you have given to a dog uh, so around after six hours means around three o'clock three o'clock in the afternoon you will reach you will get a peak t4 value okay so this peak t, t, peak t4 total t4 value should be monitored always okay so this keeps on gradually decreasing and by next day nine o'clock it will come to the minimum level so that's why the timing is very important next day nine o'clock again you have to give the same dose okay so the how to say that the dog is receiving optimal thyroxine how you have to see so you have to measure the total t4 after six hours of administration of the medicine and the total t4 value should range between 50 to 60 nanomoles per liter then it says that yes the dog is rece receiving requisite quantity of thyroxine okay if the value is less than 35 nanomoles per liter at the peak hour it says that the dose is adequate it has to be recalculated you have to increase the dose so you have started with 20 you increase to 25 microgram you increase to 30 microgram and see the 
peak T4 value. Okay. So, 35 nanomoles per liter is always say that it is an inadequate dose and there is always a uh, chance of improvement in the total dose. Then the other possibility is also there marked increase in the peak total T4 value to 90 to 100 nanomole per liter it says that there is a overdose and such dogs they are likely to develop a case a, a uh, situation of thyrotoxicosis if you continue to give with this dose you are going to cause a thyrotoxicosis okay so 90 to 100 nanomole per liter is not a favorable peak total t4 value okay so you have to reduce the dose and bring it to 50 to 60 nanomole per liter okay apart from this routine serum biochemistry for the total cholesterol and triglyceride in hematology you have to see whether any anemia uh, especially non -regenerative, regenerative anemia is a cardinal feature of canine hypothyroidism okay so whether it is improving or not okay so this also has to be kept it as a additional parameters for monitoring thyroxine supplementation potential complications the dog it has been reported and it has been proved beyond a doubt that the dogs are resistant to thyrotoxic effect of excessive T4 supplementation and it has been the experimentally it has been proved that the dose 20 times more than the standard dose can only induce the clinical thyrotoxicosis but in spite of that whatever the monitoring uh, result has shown uh, 90 to 100 millimole per liter value in peak hour is suggestive of overdose is there and it, you, you are likely to cause thyrotoxicosis. Then how to identify whether the dog is developing thyrotoxicosis or not. So these clinical signs they are indicative that there is thyrotoxicosis. So there is a polydipsia, there is polyuria, polyphagia, panting, weight loss, hyperactivity, tachycardia and pyrexia. Okay. So if these signs they develop in a dog which is being supplemented with thyroxine, you have to immediately withdraw the therapy. Thyroxine supplementation should be stopped, should be stopped immediately and the science needs to be subsided till you start with the new dose. So again you have to calculate and then you have to do the dose, dose adjustments. So thyrotoxicosis is a very serious clinical condition. So that is why you have to always keep it in mind that the dog which is maintained on thyroxine therapy does not develop thyrotoxicosis. Okay. So these are the important uh, things which I wanted to discuss with uh, you guys that canine hypothyroidism, how it is, what is the basics of canine hypothyroidism, what are the biochemical abnormalities which is seen in the canine hypothyroidism, how the case is presented to a clinic and how to diagnose it. So once the confirmation is there, then you have to start with thyroxine supplementation, which is a lifelong obligation. So once the thyroxine supplementation starts, every one, uh, once or twice in a, uh, once in a month or once in two months, you have to monitor the total T4 value, whether it is ranging between 50 to 60 nanomole per liter at peak hour. If it is there, you are giving requisite and correct dose of thyroxine. If it is less, you have to increase the dose. If it is more, you have to reduce the dose. So that is all about canine hypothyroidism. Thank you very much.